Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen from Australian Environmental Education, and I'm very excited to welcome you here this afternoon for our Children's Week series. And today we are going to talk about frogs. Uh, one of my, another one of my favourite topics to to talk about. So I've actually got a little visitor here with me. Let's see if we can have a look and say hello. So this is my green tree frog. It's probably about seventeen years old now, and he's very hungry this morning, this afternoon. So we're going to actually feed him a little bit later on so we can see some of the amazing features of frogs. What we can see at the moment is his awesome hand up there with his sticky pads and his fingers and toes that help the tree frogs climb. I wonder why you're looking at this frog if you can count how many fingers he has because that will come, come up in a moment. We'll talk about that. Okay, so I'll be sharing some slides as well, and we'll be talking a little bit about why frogs are important. Another great reason why it's a great time to talk about frogs is the weather is getting warmer. So as the weather warms up, we start hearing frogs more. So frogs are more easily identified by what they sound like than what they look like. So it's really good to go out and listen to some of the sounds that you might hear at night or in the afternoon and sometimes even in the daytime because some of the frogs don't sound like frogs. So it can be a little bit tricky to um, identify them, but most of the time, if you do hear a frog and you start getting close to maybe see if you can find it, they usually stop croaking. And most frogs are very small and brown or very small and green, so it can be really hard to find them. So using their calls is a great way to identify them. And across Australia, we have 240 different species of frog. They are found in so many different habitats. We've even got frogs found up in the alpine areas of New South Wales and Victoria called the corroboree frog. We've got frogs that live in our rainforests. We've got frogs that live in the desert. We've got lots of species of frogs that actually burrow into the desert soil waiting for the rains to come. Rains to come. And of course, we also have frogs living in your very own backyard. So how do we learn more about these frogs and how do we identify which ones are living near us? So let's go on a little bit of a journey and have a look. Oh, got my wrong frog. Oh, I'm all the way at the end, how did that happen? There we go at the beginning. This one here is a green tree frog as well. I love this photo because you can really see how big the frog's mouths are. So if you just put your hands up and think about where your ears are, that is where your mouth would start if you were a frog. So much, much bigger than ours. And frogs can pretty much eat anything that they put in their mouth. But we're going to look a little bit later about some of the challenges that happens if you put things in your mouth that are way too big and how the frogs have to swallow. So frogs are a particular group of animals. They have a backbone, so they're vertebrate animals. And they're in a special group called amphibians. And amphibians means two ways of living. And if we think of the frog life cycle, it's a great way to work out that two ways of living. So after the frog lays eggs, it has to be somewhere near water. The amphibians need water to lay their eggs. Sometimes it can be water even in hollows of trees. Sometimes I'll even lay eggs in dog water bowls or the little bits of water around pot plants. Other times they need creeks, streams, ponds, and um, other bigger bodies of water as well. Because the first part of the frog life cycle, they're tadpoles. So they hatch out of the egg and the tadpoles swim around and they breathe through gills. Over time, those tadpoles will grow back legs, then they'll grow front legs. And then instead, most some people think that their tail falls off, but their tail absolutely gets absorbed back into the body because that's really important energy for the frog. And at that point, they can come out on land and they actually can breathe through lungs. But frogs also have some really important adaptations about their skin. So frogs can absorb quite a lot of 
uh, gases and moisture through their skin. So it's really careful that they don't dry out. So that's why they need to be around water uh, most of their lives. So they don't dry out. Um, but also, sometimes we call them environmental indicators because they're quite sensitive to chemicals and pollution. So that's another reason why if you do find frogs, that we don't pick them up, even if you're very tempted to, because the things on our skin can actually make frogs very sick. So just imagine a very hot day, you were being very sun smart and you put sunscreen on before you went outside. Well, that sunscreen, if you picked up a frog, can actually be absorbed into the skin and make that frog sick. And in some cases, it could even die. Same thing goes for air guard. Again, being safe outside, don't want to get bitten by anything, um, that air guard is a great option. But if we then touch our frogs, that can be really dangerous. So for my little friend here, I think he's turned around. Here we go. Let's see if we zoom in. We can see I've got a little bit of water in the bottom of the dish there of the container, but we can see that really sort of shiny, damp skin. So when I uh, take him out of the tank, I need to make sure I haven't put moisturiser or any other material on my hands. And really, I'm very, very careful um, when I pick him up and put him straight in the container. And when the, uh, we're finished with the session today, I'll put him back in his tank. I won't even um, pick him up out of the container. I'll open the container and let him walk out whenever he's ready. So I'm touching him as little as possible because that skin is so important, helps them breathe, absorb water, but also lots of other things in the environment. And that's why it is really important we think about what kind of habitats we can create for our frogs as well. So have a little think about where you might have heard or seen a frog before. And we'll talk about habitats in a moment. So these are a collection of photos of frog feet. And if you have a close look, you might be able to count how many toes they have. So frogs have five toes. And it's such a big variety from those sticky pads that might mean that it's a tree climbing frog to long skinny toes that might be good for digging. If we move on to our hands, hmm, I wonder if you can notice something a little bit different. How many toes? We're on the hands, how many fingers do they have? And of course, if you spotted it before when you were counting on the tree frog here, you'd notice that there are four. So frogs only have four fingers. But again, we can see some of those sticky pads on their uh, fingers to help them climb. And some of the really short toes here for some of the frogs that may be digging, but lots of different colors as well. And this helps these frogs camouflage into the environment. So the frogs want to blend in to their environment so they don't stand out. And frogs can do a bit of color change. So my green tree frog here can sometimes go quite brown in color if he's trying to blend into the rocks. Other times, especially when they're trying to get a bit of sun and warmth, they'll be very bright green. So I know that the frogs that I have in my tank at home are males because they make the croaking sound. So they will call, sometimes it's when it's about to rain, sometimes it's if we've got the television, really low bass on the television will sometimes make the frogs croak as well. But what's really interesting is it's the vocal sac here. So it is a living part of the frog that helps them make the noise to make the croaking sound. And remember, every species of frog has a different call. Let's listen to a couple. Oh, I don't have a call of this one. This is from my backyard. This is a Perrin's tree frog. This is the most common frog that I have living near me. And it is quite common um, across um, many parts of Australia. So they're quite a big frog, getting up to sort of maybe five, six centimetres in size. He's really showing off for us here. We can see the sticky pads on his toes. But what we've got here is that big circle there is actually their ears. So we've got our extra bits on our ears. They just have the flat 
circles there. And it's a little bit like the eardrum picking up vibrations there. Again, we can see his mouth starting all the way there. And we've got our nostrils that help him breathe. Now, this particular frog was camouflaging to be on the side of my barbecue. Now, not sure what you think, but I definitely don't think a barbecue is the best place for a frog to be hiding. So we keep moving this frog into the garden nearby and it keeps making its way back to the barbecue. So every time we turn the barbecue on, now we have to be super careful. We check that there's the, this particular frog is not hiding inside. So I'll tell you what habitat I've made for this frog to see if I can get him to move from my barbecue into a new home. This is green tree frog. This is a much bigger green tree frog than I've got here. Um, he's probably, oh, maybe 25 years old. He is a big frog. Again, we can see those ears and the big smile of his mouth. But let's have a listen. I think the green tree frog has one of the classic frog calls. If we think of sort of that croak noise that people often describe frogs making, that um, I always think this one's quite close. It's sort of a rock, 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 and gee, they can get very loud. I often try to see whether the green tree frog here is going to respond to the call. Every now and again, he does. He definitely got interested and he's looking at the screen so he can see the picture of his cousin. This is another frog perfectly camouflaged and this is called the striped marsh frog. And the striped marsh frog is what we would call a ground dwelling frog. It's not climbing trees um, and it is often found by people doing gardening. So again, it, this one is a, quite a big frog. But the thing I love about this frog is its call. It doesn't sound like a frog at all. Let's listen. Ooh, play that again. So can you hear that weird sort of talking noise? Sometimes described as a little bit like a, a chicken, like a block of a chicken. These, this particular species of frog has this very unusual call. And a lot of people don't realize that they have a frog around because it's got this strange sound. So this is one that you could try at home. I'll show you how to do it. If you put your tongue at the roof of your mouth and click your tongue forward. Let's see if we can all do it together now. So that is a little bit similar to the call of the striped marsh frog. So just remember, if you are out in the backyard or you're listening for sounds, sometimes the noises are not what you think they are. So that's one of my favorites. So having a think about different habitats for frogs. So this is a pond in my backyard. And it's very important that we provide protection for our frogs as well. Remember I said if they get too hot, they can dry out because they've got that very special moist skin. So if you had a pond right out in full summer Australian sun, you probably won't get many frogs visit because it is very, very hot. So whatever habitat you create, make sure you create some sunny areas and some shady areas. So this pond here, I've used the black pond liner that you can buy at hardware stores and landscaping stores. And we had a hole in our backyard that was dug for us because we had some plumbers come in. So I thought, Ooh, I'm going to make a frog pond out of this area. So I did some research about the different types of frogs that I have in my area. And I decided a pond is a great op option, but I also needed a couple of other things. So I've got a big variety of habitats for frogs in my backyard. When we're building ponds, you can actually have lots of different uh, depths. So some frogs like the striped marsh frog, like um, really shallow areas and slightly um, 
uh, wet, moist soil. There are other frogs, well, tadpoles especially, that will need larger water um, to swim around in. I've got lots of plants in there. I've got sticks and rocks. So frogs, once they become adults, could crawl out and climb out of the pond because not all frogs can swim very well and frogs can actually drown in big um, bodies of water. So being careful, what's also the best thing about my pond is the other animals that come and live here. So I've got um, lots of other little freshwater invertebrates. So remember animals with no backbone that are living in this environment as well. And they become food for the tadpoles and the adult frogs. So lots of shade. You can also use shallow dishes that you can put out. And these kinds of environments are not only good for frogs, but are also great when it's hot and there's summer, just for water for wildlife. So you might find lots of other animals using that water in a hot summer period. You can also do these kinds of ponds that are called above ground ponds. This is a terracotta pot that has a cork um, silicon in the bottom, so there's no hole anymore. Uh, filled up with water. Again, we can see those excellent little um, uh, pond plants in there as well. So what it means, it gives it a little bit of protection um, from other things around. So some of the frogs that might climb up um, and use that, making sure they can't get stuck and gives them lots of opportunities to, um, to escape if they need to. So rocks, shade and branches so they can come and go however they need to. And this is the last habitat I'll show you. This is called a frog hotel. So what I did to make this was use a uh, plastic tub, like one of the camping tubs that you can use. And I got some PVC tubes, different diameters, which means sizes like this and different lengths. And I put them in this container with some plants at the front as well. And it means that I can move my frog hotel around because tree frogs are not really going to want to live in my pond but they are going to live in those tubes, especially when they're calling and making lots of noise, those tubes help their call sound even louder. So they love that. You can also use these tubes and actually just um, carefully strap them to the tree branches, or you can have the tubes straight into the ground and have single tubes moving around. Now, this particular environment, the Frog Hotel, I moved this one up to where my barbecue is because the parents tree frog I was worried that it could get hurt or injured um, in the barbecue because it also gets a lot of sun and it's got a black cover over the top and I was worried that it would be not a great habitat so I've put the frog hotel nearby and I'm hoping that the parents tree frog will move from the barbecue to the frog hotel and that's a really important factor when you are thinking about different habitats to design and build for your local frogs that you can't go out and collect frogs from the from nature and move them into your new frog habitats it's one of those things that if you build it over time the frogs will move in there so it could take it a, a season or a year could take even longer. But by creating these really lovely environments, you're encouraging not only frogs, but other species into your backyard. So how do we know more? How do we find out what these frogs are? I've only given you a couple of calls, but how do you find out more? So there is a great program called Frog ID, developed by the Australian Museum, and there's an app uh, built by IBM that you can record frog calls and it's so easy so there's two ways you can do it you can go onto the frog id website and you can just search um, either location and state or if you've seen the frog and you can uh, put that information in and every pretty much every frog across Australia is in their database and you can have a look where they might be found some pictures and best of all listen to that audio. So then next time you hear it, you'll go, ah, I know what frog that is. The other option is maybe with your parents' um, help, ask them to download the free Frog ID app. You can put it on an, either an Android or an iPhone. And what you can do next time you hear a frog, say, mom, dad, let's go outside and they can record that call. You can submit it and the Australian Museum will listen to it and identify it for you. And then you'll get an email back saying, this is the frog that you found. 
The best thing about the app is you can actually put your location into it so you can then search the frogs that could be found in your local area. And that is the information that you can use to design the best habitat for the frogs that live near you. Remembering a big variety is great. Some frogs might need a pond, some frogs might need a frog hotel, but all animals and wildlife do need water. So making sure that you have shady spaces in your garden, uh, bits of water that they can come and um, use, you'll not only encourage frogs into your garden, but a really big variety, other variety of wildlife. And that is very exciting. So I will, uh, I think I've put it in the link of the uh, YouTube uh, clip, some information that you can do to find out more about frogs and also to create your own frog habitats. Now, my green tree frog, who is looking intently at the screen, let's have a look at him now. He lives in a tank. So it is really important. Remember what I said that we don't collect frogs from the wild. One, we can impact them by what's on our hands, but also there are some diseases that some frogs can get and that can be passed on if you put frogs in a tank and then you let them out, that frog could pass on a disease. Or if you've got captive frogs, that those frogs could get sick from the one, um, the new one. So it's really, really important that you don't collect frogs from the wild. Now, my frog here, my green tree frog, I have a license to keep this frog and I need, I, you buy them from a licensed breeder. So even if you do have a license, you still can't go out and just collect them from anywhere. And so that is quite important. Now, he was pretty hungry before. He's very, very close to the screen. I wonder if even if I put my finger there, he might even, oh, there we go. He stuck his tongue out. And I want to see if he can do that again. I'm going to zoom out a little bit because he moves so quickly. Let's see. Because I'd really, if we can, I'd really like you to see where the frog's tongue is attached. So if you notice there, sorry, it really catches the light. The tongue is attached at the front of their mouth. Now, that's really important. When they eat really big food, they don't have their tongue at the back of their mouth like we do because that helps us swallow. So how are the frogs going to swallow? Now, I'm just going to try to prop it up a little bit at the same time to, so it's not too, there we go. So it's a little bit glary. There we go. And I'm going to feed this frog a cricket. Now, again, I buy these crickets from the pet store. And they are to feed the frogs here. Oh, it's going to jump out. There we go. So if you don't want to see a frog eat a cricket, it is okay. Look away. Now, because he's been so keen, hopefully he'll get this one straight away. I want you to look at what happens to his eyes. <laughs> okay, he's just gone completely upside down. There we go. And he's right behind the dirty part of my tank there. Now, in a moment, just keep an eye on his eyes. Oh, too quick. I think he swallowed it whole. So usually you can see his eyes close. But he was too quick and he ate the tweezers. So let's see if we can get him to go this way again. Look, look at his eyes. Oh, there we go. Big push in. Did you see how he pushed his eyeballs into his head? They use their hands and fingers sometimes to just wipe their face. And they will push their eyes into, into the mouth to try to push the food down. Because remember how large their mouths are. 
Remember, we only, I only just fed him quite small crickets, but imagine if he tried to eat a mouse or a lizard, even another frog. Sometimes those things are quite big. Sometimes they give up and they have to spit them out, but other times they will work really hard. They'll push their eyes in to help swallow that food. So he looks super happy with himself. And we can see that amazing green color of this green tree frog. So everyone, a few things to remember to take away from our session today. One, there is 240 different species of frog found throughout Australia. Pretty much every habitat other than the marine environment, you can find different species of frog. The best way to identify the frogs in your area is by listening to them, by their calls. If you don't know if it's a frog or an insect or another animal, you can use frog ID and listen to the calls from the frogs around you. You can also use the frog ID app to record those calls and send them through to the Australian Museum and they'll identify them for you. That information, that project's been going, oh, I think oh, three or four years now. And all of that, what we call data, every single one of those calls has gone into a database to help us understand where frogs are. Are there frogs in your backyard that 20 years ago didn't live in this area? Are there frogs that used to live in your area that aren't found there anymore? Are some frogs calling earlier in the year? Are some frog species calling for longer? All of these pieces of information are really important to help scientists know more about frogs because frogs all across Australia are threatened. They are, um, have issues with uh, where they're living, the temperature rising, bushfires, habitat destruction, and of course, that um, disease, that chytrid fungus um, that gets out into wild populations and can absolutely um, kill many, many frogs. So that's the last thing to remember, guys, don't pick up any frogs. Even if you think your hands are clean, it can still be quite dangerous for a frog. If you see a frog that's injured or sick, you can usually call the wildlife rescuers in your local area and they can come and um, collect that frog. And remember, creating wildlife friendly backyards are great for not only frogs, but for lots of other species that you might find in your uh, local area. Having water out during summer, creating um, amazing habitats, encouraging lots of those sort of mini beasts like insects and things like that into your garden will then encourage those other animals that are seeking food like your frogs. So guys, hopefully this is just the beginning of your journey um, in learning more about frogs and you go out, do some more research, find the frogs that live in your local area and try to create some frog friendly environments. So thank you so much for joining me here today and I look forward to seeing you again soon. And on behalf of myself um, and Virtual Excursions Australia, I really appreciate you joining us for these fabulous Children's Week sessions. Mm -hmm.